This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. So on to Jeffrey Wall, uh, Professor of Gene Expression here at the Salk Institute. He is the chair of the faculty for the Salk Institute. It has a faculty of about 55, and that's an elected position of great honor, and he is the chair of the faculty this year. His um, background and interest has a particular focus on gene pathways in cancer growth and development. He has a BA in bacteriology from UCLA, a PhD in biological chemistry from Harvard, and he did a postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford University. Um, Professor Wall joined the Salk Institute in the Gene Expression Lab in 1989. So thank you for hosting us, and let me turn things over to you. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the Salk faculty, administration, and staff, I want to welcome you to our institution. As the elected chair of the faculty and its uh, representative uh, for occasions such as this, it is my great honor to do so. I understand that over the past two days, you've been pondering the question, what's next? This is a question that those of us at the SALT ponder at least once a day, often multiple times a day. And though I wasn't asked to speak about it, I'll just tell you that from my perspective, the question of what's next in biology is, how is it that we deal with the mounds of data that are impinging on our labs on a daily basis and convert all of that data to knowledge and hopefully to wisdom? Because in wisdom, we'll be able to fulfill one of the important requirements that Jonas Salk had of us, and that is, and I was fortunate enough to know him, he said, we must all act to be wise ancestors. Now, when you think about that, it means that you must always think about what you're doing today because of the consequences that it will have on future generations. At the Salk Institute, the way we've interpreted his comments is that our mission should be to explore questions at the root of the biological principles of life to improve human health for future generations. Now, how can we do that in a faculty of just 55 professors and a total staff numbering less than 1,000. Well, what we have to do is we have to take on, I think, the grand challenges of our time. The way we do that is the following. The institute is divided into rough thirds, but not by the number of people. There are four laboratories whose emphasis is to understand how plants respond to light, heat, and stress to develop better ways to feed the growing population of the earth. The Salk was really ahead of its time with Fred de Hoffman starting a plant biology program in 1979. About half the labs at the Institute study problems such as I do, the genes and cells that contribute to cancer initiation and progression so that we can control cancer, for it is one of the great killers of our time in Western society as, as we are able to live longer Cancer is an inevitable consequence of aging. How can we prevent it? And if we can't prevent it, how can we develop better ways of managing it? 
The remainder of the institute, another approximately half of the institute, uh, has laboratories such as you'll visit today that deal with questions on how the brain senses and processes signals to create actions, memory, and consciousness. This last problem of how consciousness is generated was one of Francis Crick's last projects that he worked on even at his deathbed. It's a problem that still remains to be solved. You might consider that all of these topics fall under the under overarching umbrella of the theme of healthy aging. We're fortunate enough to live in societies where we will live longer. How do we achieve that in the most healthy way possible? I was asked to give you an introduction to the structure of the building that you will be visiting today. There are four buildings. The East Buildings, one of which you're in now, was actually Jonas Salk's last contribution to the plan of this institute. He and Louis Kahn developed the overall ground plan. Jonas was involved in developing the building plans as well, and I remember seeing him working with the construction workers figuring out just the right mix of concrete to develop the kind of concrete that you see here, which is very special because of the way that it reflects light. Um, as you walk around, you're not going to be able to appreciate this because of all the mess that's in most labs. But this lab was built, this entire structure was built with a philosophy to maximize interaction and creativity. There are no internal structural supporting walls in any of the lab buildings. Jonas Salk felt about science as he felt about the body, that it's organic, that it changes over time, and that it should be flexible. He didn't want any room numbers, walls, or doors that would prevent people from interacting with each other. Now, this actually creates a problem when, you at, when somebody asks you where you're located. Oh, I'm in the north building on the west side right across from the bathroom. You know, it's actually an IQ test for graduate students. <laughs> so this is meant so that labs can change over time, so that people mix their ideas up, so that neurobiologists are next to cancer biologists, because we're all dealing with problems related to those central to life and healthy aging. How successful has the model been? 55 labs freestanding, not-for-profit, research institute, heavily dependent upon federal funding for its programs. Uh, now, this model has become a little bit tenuous recently, and we all need to be thinking about that if we feel that scientific research is essential to healthy aging, and you may want to discuss that as well. But let me give you an idea in, the objective, in some objective terms about how successful the SALK has been with this model. We can claim five Nobel laureates. More importantly, I think, is that those five Nobel laureates have had trainees in their labs, another five of whom have also gone on to win the Nobel Prize. We have 10 members of the Howard Hughes Medical Inst uh, Institute. 20% of the faculty are HHMI fellows. That's pretty incredible. We have 16 members of the National Academy of Sciences. Almost a third of the faculty, a fourth of the faculty are member, members of the National Academy. We have two American Cancer Society professors. In addition, I don't know if you're aware of this, in the entire United States, there are only 10 people who are members of all three national academies, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the Institute of Medicine. We have one of them in Terry Sanowski, whose lab you'll visit today. There are other examples of institute success that I'd like to um, explain to you. These are um, metrics that are determined uh, by our peers in evaluating the value of the scientific publications that we produce. Thomson Reuters recently ranked our plant biology program, which I told you is only four labs out of the 55 at the institute, as the number one in the world. Simago Institution's ranking, or the SIR World Report, identified the SALK among 3,000 institutions that it surveyed as among the top five. That's remarkable for a faculty of 55. The institute faculty have won every major scientific award that's available. 
They've been elected as presidents of almost every major society in the United States and worldwide. So I think that Jonas's notion of how an institute should be designed, I think, has met with a considerable amount of success. The institute was founded on the assumption that uncovering the basic principles that govern biology would lead to improvements in human health. Has this come to fruition? Let me give you a few examples. We can't claim that the discovery of the polio vaccine is one of Salk's because Jonas Salk, of course, developed it when he was in Pittsburgh. But what about what's been done here? Leslie Orgel, um, a famous scientist who unfortunately died of pancreatic cancer a few years ago, was interested in the origins of life, a fundamental basic question. But in his route to discover it, to investigating the, the um, secrets of life, the origins of life, he developed a compound called cytosine arabinoside, which turned out to be a cornerstone for the treatment of leukemia for three decades. Roger Guillemin almost single-handedly discovered the field of neuroendocrinology, where he uncovered many peptides that have been used to treat a number of different um, cancers, as well as being important for artificial insemination. Renato Del Becco, Nobel, and I should say that um, Roger Guillemin won the Nobel Prize for that work. R Renato Del Becco, also a Nobel Prize winner for his work in cancer-associated genes, was a very quiet person, and when he spoke, people tended to listen. And he wrote um, a one-page article in Science Magazine in which he said that important uh, insights into cancer and heritable diseases will only come once we sequence every single base in the human genome, which was then accomplished. Not by him, but by others. He provided the inspiration. You need to ask the right question in the right way to inspire others to answer it, and he did so. Ron Evans, my friend and neighbor, uh, discovered uh, a family of proteins called nuclear receptors that control um, our responses to stress, uh, to glucocorticoids, to retinoids. They're involved in development. And also, among this super family of nuclear receptors is the thyroid hormone receptor, which his group recently showed to be involved in one form of sudden infant death syndrome. And just in the past few weeks, that article came out a week ago, Salk scientists reported the discovery of proteins that enable us to wake up in the morning and how a hormone activates molecular switches in the pancreas to increase insulin production. We might develop better sleeping medicines, and we also may develop um, more effective treatments designer drugs to help the 80 million Americans with type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetic insulin resistance from these discoveries. I want to conclude, as I began, with a, some thoughts from Jonas Salk. Um, you may consider that making discoveries entails an element of luck. You have to be in the right place at the right time with the right tools at hand. Here. Jonas has enabled us to define luck as increasing the probability that preparedness will intersect with opportunity. And you'll note as you travel around the Institute that it was designed to do just that. As you enter the courtyard, the magnificent signature of this Institute, there's a quote that I'd like you to dwell on. It's one of Jonas's, it's one of my favorites, and it says, hope lies in dreams, in imagination, and in the courage of those who dare to make dreams into reality. Clearly, you who are attending this conference display the characteristics that Jonas was referring to. You've become wise ancestors in your own time. You've had the courage to turn your dreams into reality, and in so doing, have altered the um, lives of many who will come after you. I hope that you have a wonderful day, an inspiring time, and that by the end of your afternoon, you're able to come up with the answers to what's next. Thank you. It's now my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Corby Kummer, who's senior editor of The Atlantic. Corby has had a particular focus across his three decades with us on uh, issues of food, agriculture, nutrition, and healthcare. 
He's the curator of the Atlantic's dedicated channel on food and health and life on theatlantic.com. Corby is a five-time winner of the James Beard Journalism Award and a graduate of Yale University. So I turn things over to Corby Kummer with an interview of Ira Magaziner. Ira Magaziner is not only distinguished as the valedictorian of his Brown University class and a Rhodes Scholar, um, but also as the first person in our time to, in our recent time, to try to create and be the architect of a national health care plan that in many ways gave rise to the one that we now have, which I will be asking him about, but only later, because um, there's so much of his work <coughs> at the Clinton Health Access Initiative that I'd like us to be brought up to date about this morning. Um, Mr. Magaziner has just come from Seattle where he was, I, I asked him, you do work with the Gates Foundation, don't you? Well, hand in glove in, in, in many ways. And I'm going to ask you to use as an example of the kind of quick effectiveness that uh, you can achieve internationally in a way that isn't always possible in Washington. Um, to give us the example of the rotavirus vaccine that you were telling us about and, um, and tell us how you work at Clinton. Uh, well, perhaps the only thing I learned in Washington is to answer the question I want to answer instead of the one I'm asked. And um, I've tried to tailor so it. Me, I've tried to tailor it already. So I, will, I will answer your question, but, but um, let me start just with a bit of background because I think it might be helpful in answering the question if you'll permit me. Um, so back in 2002, President Clinton was starting his foundation, and uh, uh, I made the mistake of having lunch with him. And, and at the end of that lunch, uh, after offering some ideas on what he ought to do with his foundation, uh, he accepted the idea I offered. Uh, and that was to focus initially on the global AIDS crisis. Uh, at that time in 2002, uh, we had already been treating people in the United States and Europe with triple therapy that had come on the scene in the mid-90s. But in the developing world, there were over 3 million people dying every year and only 70,000 people on treatment. And at that time, uh, the crisis was growing, the number of people being infected growing. And I urged him that uh, this would be a role that we could take on and maybe make a contribution. And I went to see a number of the leaders we had worked with in the White House. I was his senior policy advisor in the White House. Uh, and basically the line that we got from many people whose names I won't mention was it's too complicated to treat people for AIDS in poor countries uh, and it's too expensive. And the, the, you know, we're places where people live on $300 per capita income per day and the treatments are just for the drugs and tests, $1,200 per person per day, you can't afford it. And the subtext of it is you know, if poor Africans die, uh, that happens all the time anyway, so what are you going to do? And it was a really morally objectionable stance, and I came back to Clinton and said, we have to do this. And I doubt that it was I that convinced him ultimately, but we were at the World AIDS Conference in Barcelona that year, and Nelson Mandela, uh, who's a bit more persuasive than me, uh, came over to Clinton and said, you know, uh, you really have to take this thing on. And then he turned to me and said, and you have to help him, and so that was that. Uh, so. Basically, we started out then, and uh, I want to just give you a, a minute on the approach we took, and then I'll come to answer your question on rotavirus vaccine. What we recognized from the beginning was that um, the main thing we could do is to try to get scale up. In other words, Doctors Without Borders and Partners in Health and other groups were treating people in small numbers and uh, successfully. But to really scale up, we had to work with governments because governments run the healthcare systems. And we also had to help build systems in the countries uh, because it's not just a question of giving people pills. There's got to be a testing infrastructure, distribution infrastructure, uh, as well as a procurement infrastructure. And also we had to do something about lowering the cost because uh, it, was just, it was too expensive and the donors weren't going to step up for that much money. And I knew from my own background in, as a business strategist that the drugs shouldn't have to cost that much, the diagnostics shouldn't have to cost that much. So to make a very long story short, what we did was to go into a number of countries, partner with the governments, help them build the systems they needed to deliver care, uh, and we became trusted advisors to the governments in doing that. And then we worked on a set of negotiations globally that used a lot of what I had learned during my career as a business strategist in the 80s 
in introducing total quality management procurement to organizations like GE and others uh, about uh, how to do this. So basically the philosophy was that you organize the buyers together uh, and then you work with the suppliers instead of you know getting on opposite sides of the table and yelling about price. You work with the suppliers to lower the total system's cost of producing and delivering the drugs. And then the companies are still able to make money, but the prices can come down. And the fact that the prices are coming down gives you a virtuous circle because it creates the ability for a bigger market, which helps you get the cost down. So drugs, and I'll come to your answer in a second on, on vaccines, are very capital intensive industries. So if you can get guaranteed volumes, you can get honest procurements, you can focus in on you know, five or six or seven drugs to produce. You can go all the way back in the supply chain and work at each stage of it. And then you can organize the procurement to be long term with predictable forecasts and so on. Then the companies can set up for large scale production and continuous production, which lowers their cost dramatically. And then we got the companies to agree to try this and to forward price into the higher volumes in order to help us create the markets. So what we were able to do then was take the average cost of first line drugs down from $600 to $300 to $130 and now below $100 per person per year. And then we did the same thing with diagnostics, CD4 tests, viral load tests, uh, rapid tests, other tests that were necessary because the diagnostic costs were high. And they were typically around $40 a test and we're now down to about a dollar and a half a test for CD4 tests. And so the overall cost of treating somebody went down from $1,200 in a poor country uh, for the drugs and tests down now to about $110 for people on first-line drugs. Then we set about doing that on second-line drugs and then in a variety of other areas. And then we've moved into taking the new technologies that a number of you in this room are involved in developing and trying to roll them out faster. So things like point-of-care testing uh, and more accurate TB testing and other things, we are accelerating the rollout of these things and also at the same time increasing their volume and lowering their costs. Uh, and then we've spread now into 35 countries, and I'll come back later, but we're working on issues now related to the rest of service delivery and how to make that more efficient and effective. And the world, meanwhile, uh, with the support of many people, not just us, but we've played a role, has gone from those 70,000 people in treatment to well over 6 million in treatment now, uh, and still heading upwards. Now, I'll answer your question. So when we did this with AIDS... You've given me uh, others to ask. Um, uh, a number of people in the world community said, how about malaria? Can you help with malaria? So we helped uh, with the new ACT drugs and got those uh, which are more effective but were more expensive. And they were trying to put a global subsidy for malaria drugs in. But the problem there was a bit different, which is that from the point that a drug would hit um, the port in Mombasa, let's say, uh, by the time it got to a customer, and uh, more than half of malaria drugs as opposed to AIDS drugs went through private channels it got marked up by 600% uh, through all the middlemen in Africa that would take a piece of it. So the people willing to give a uh, subsidy were saying, well, we don't want to subsidize that 600% markup. What do we do? So we did some work uh, working with private sector initially on an effort in Tanzania, and now we're rolling out in 14 countries where we cut from 600% to 30% the cost of distribution through the private sector. And now we've rolled out, I think we're up to about 50 million uh, doses of ACTs and, and we're heading up to a stable systems in a lot of countries and then we're moving into other areas. So Gates asked us to then look at vaccines because as many of you in this room know they're putting a lot of money into the development of new vaccines uh, and the typical path with vaccines uh, is that they'd be introduced in the US and Europe, they'd be here for quite a few years and then they'd be taken to poor countries and then it would take anywhere from 10 to 15 years to get up to 80 percent coverage in those poor countries. And what we set out to try to do with the Gates Foundation was number one, to try to lower the price right up front um, of, uh, uh, of the vaccines for the poor countries. And then secondly, to accelerate the rollout in those countries. So within five years to get up to 80% and to introduce it at the same time we're introducing in the developed world. And rotavirus was the first example we took last year where essentially the lowest price was about uh, uh, $7.50, $7.50 a dose or $15 for a full course of the vaccine for rotavirus. It hadn't been rolled out in poor countries. And at $15, it was judged to be too expensive for the efficacy. And the typical way that, drug, uh, that vaccines are purchased, and vaccines are even more capital intensive than drugs because there's a lot more upfront testing that has to take place 
in order to uh, show their efficacy and safety. And uh, a lot more capital intensity to the uh, uh, equipment you have to put in place and, and often a lot more R&D, as people in this institute would know better than anybody in the world. And so the key issue, for if you're a vaccine manufacturer, is what's my volume going to be? Because I got to take all those fixed upfront costs and amortize them across a large volume or else I get screwed in my cost, right? And the way the people were procuring for the poor countries was they were going out for bid to manufacturers and then saying, we want to know what your price is going to be. But by the way, we're going to purchase for poor countries. We think this is what the market's going to be, but we're not going to guarantee you any volumes. At the same time, there's a group called the Pan American Health Organization that's done great work in Latin America rolling out vaccines for mainly middle-income countries in Latin America. And they had a most favored nation clause, which said that they had to get the lowest price in the world from the manufacturer. <coughs> so if you were a manufacturer, when you would put a bid on for the poor countries, you'd know that your middle income country price was going to come down to that level through PAHO and then the other middle income countries. So you had no incentive whatsoever to offer a low price. And as a result, higher prices were being offered. Now, still lower prices than in the United States, but still high prices that were unaffordable. So what we did is we convinced Bill Gates to say, look, to break this cycle, why don't you use your balance sheet, which is ample, uh, and say that you will guarantee 125 million doses over the next five years as a jump start for poor countries. And we'll put that volume guarantee on the table, go to the companies, and negotiate based on that volume, and say what we want to do is work on a cost plus basis with you, but we're going to guarantee you this amount of volume and uh, that will not only help you uh, on that cost, but it'll actually lower your overall cost for the developed world too, because that bigger volume helps you for all your sales. And we went through this sort of dynamic modeling with them, much like we had done with the AIDS drug companies and diagnostic companies, and got a price. And then they said, okay, we're willing to give you this price, and we make a little bit of money on it, not what we'd make elsewhere, but we don't want them to lose money because it's not sustainable. So they made a little bit of money. But they said, but you got to do something about PAHO because we can't offer this to all the middle income countries. So then we negotiated with PAHO and got them to agree to a price that was lower than what they had today, but still higher than the poor country price, making the argument that a tiered pricing structure for vaccines made sense. Middle income countries should pay less than high income, but more than low income. And so we negotiated that. And then we were able to go to the donors and say, okay, now we have $5 rotavirus vaccine instead of $15 per child. We cut it by two thirds, okay? And at that cost, it was really cost effective as a way to save lives. So the donors stepped up last June and basically fully funded the rollout. So we didn't even have to use the Gates balance sheet for the guarantee. And now we've rolled over the Gates balance sheet and we're on to the next couple of vaccine negotiations. Can, I, can I stop you right there? Because yeah, you should stop you just, talk for your whole <laughs> You just answered a question I was going to ask when you were talking about the uh, negotiations to bring down the price of AIDS drugs mm. before you just brought it. I was wondering, what is the incentive and what's the tiered structure for poor, uh, middle-income, and rich yeah. countries? So you just told us what it was On for the vaccines, But it's different, it's different for vaccines than it is for AIDS. From our point of view, in AIDS, uh, low- and middle-income countries uh, should get the same price, and they do under our contracts. Uh, and over 4 million people now are buying under the contracts we negotiated, uh, or for 4 million people. Mm -hmm. But there, you know, if you have a South Africa, it's, it's technically a middle-income country, but the burden of AIDS is so high that it really should, needs to get the lowest price. So uh, we just worked on behalf of the South African government, negotiated an agreement that brings in tenofovir and other uh, drugs that are, uh, have been second line that are now moving to first line. Uh, and we saved the South African government $700 million over two years. And what they're being able to do now, we're working with them on uh, getting to universal testing in South Africa and increasing the number of people on treatment from what was 800,000 to what will be 3.2 million on treatment within three and a half years. But what was the incentive for the companies? They make more money ultimately, right? Because what's happening is that um, as you get more volumes, uh, their costs go down and their total market goes up. So they make less money per mm -hmm. dose, if you will, but overall, they're making more money than they're getting But you hadn't gone to someone like Gates and say, we're going to guarantee a volume so that they will step up and do these In that case, we didn't guarantee. What we did is, uh, at that point, what if you were, um, well, first of all, let me tell the full story. We went to the R&D companies in the US and Europe 
And they said no to us back in 2003. But there were some Indian companies, one South African company that were WHO qualified. Mm -hmm. We went to them. And the picture they were looking started at. Started undercutting all of the rest of the companies. Well, uh, the rest of the companies had the opportunity and they didn't take the opportunity. The good news is, the good news is that now they are, right? So after we succeeded, uh, and I, I'll, sorry, I'm, I know I'm talking too much, but I'm gonna, I'll tell you the story because it's interesting. And you asked the question. The, the, um, <laughs> so the, uh, when we negotiated the drug deal, basically the, the first one, the companies were taking a chance, but what they were looking at was a 70,000 person market, which wasn't going anywhere, and where 30% of the time they didn't get paid, and where there was a bit of corruption here and there, uh, so uh, that was a problem. And what we promised them is A, an honest procurement, uh, volumes that would potentially go up to a couple million, uh, forecasts they could rely upon, and so on, and that even though they would make less per unit, they'd make profit that would be bigger overall. And then we asked them to forward price to year three of the volumes we expected. We said, if we don't achieve those volumes, you can break the deal, mm -hmm. okay? But it worked. And so the companies are very happy. You know, instead of selling 70,000, now they're selling drugs for six million. And uh, their costs have come way down. The prices have come down, the tenders are honest, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's worked out for everybody. And uh, any good business deal has to work out for everybody. Now, we had offered this to the R&D companies. They turned us down. Uh, and, uh, but then once we had done the drug deal and we went to the diagnostic companies about AIDS diagnostics, mm -hmm. they saw what had happened with the drug agreement. I remember the CEO of the largest CD4 manufacturer saying to me, we don't want you putting Indian companies in competition with us. We'll do the deal with you, right? Because we warned the R&D companies. We said, look, we're coming to you first. You develop these drugs. We believe in intellectual property where, you know, but, um, but if you don't want to play, we're going to go to the Indians. And they didn't believe us. They thought we were bluffing. Mm -hmm. So, but now what happened is then the diagnostic companies understood. So we did our deals with the US and European <coughs> diagnostic companies. And then more recently over the past couple of years, and I should say this, the R&D drug companies now under mainly new leadership uh, are cooperating with us now and we have great partnerships with a lot of the big US and, and European You also companies. said something beforehand that I found really provocative and interesting as for this rotavirus uh, example, um, that you wanted to make rollout contemporaneous of a new vaccine or product with, uh, with the United States and the developed world as, as opposed to the typical five-year delay. Yeah in Africa, and you said that you did it, and I thought, you know, you waved a magic wand, you waved a magic balance sheet from Bill Gates, how did you yeah. do this? No, well look, the, the, the main work on the ground on rollout is, is in-country work, and the way we're organized, we have uh, uh, people on the ground in, in 35 countries who partner with the governments, and we always partner with governments, we work for the governments. Uh, it's their country, we're in as advisors and helpers. And uh, things like rolling out um, uh, the AIDS care and treatment and scaling it up or malaria or vaccines is always done in partnership with the governments and local NGOs. And that's a lot of very nitty gritty work. It's, it's um, figuring out, first of all, with the vaccine, how are you gonna time it with the other vaccination campaigns going on? Uh, does it need a special cold chain or not? Or can you piggyback on existing chains that exist? Uh, get, getting registrations in place, uh, and then training a lot of people around the country to to administer and to to deal with it. And it's just a lot of just blocking and tackling kind of work that you would do in developing any market. And the way we're organized is we have people on the ground who do that kind of work, mainly local nationals who work with the governments in support of the governments. And then we have our global teams that do things like the negotiations I described. Mm -hmm. And then they work together. And the working together allows you to accelerate things because we know it's in the pipeline with the companies who are negotiating the deals. You know, things like uh, there's a new TB um, uh, testing uh, technology that we're helping accelerate the rollout of mm -hmm. that we know is coming and we're working on behalf of the South African government, which is gonna be the first big purchaser. But we're also negotiating with the company and on the ground, we have a team that's working with the government to accelerate the rollout and do all the training and everything necessary to get it up and going faster. So again, it's a virtuous cycle where it's good for the country, it's good for the donors, it's good for the company because they're gonna get their product rolled out faster, 
and what we want from them is, is lower prices that help us jumpstart it. And in most high-tech businesses with high growth potential markets, the idea of forward pricing has been long established as a good business strategy. And so that's what we ask the companies to do in this case. And now we've got a good enough track record of succeeding where there are enough companies out there who said, say this really worked for us, that it gives us greater credibility to, to do it in new areas. Well, now that we've got the example of an inspiring international collaboration between government and business and many different kinds of stakeholders and partners, um, and I only have time for one more question. It'll be a very simple one. Let's go to the Obama administration's health care reform, and, um, which follows perfectly from this inspiring. I see our time is up. I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and I know um, I, I asked you in advance whether you would say what would, be a, a, what would have been on your wish list from your noble attempts to bring about such a plan. Um, and I know you have no interest in giving me that answer, but um, what's a framework by which the current uh, Republicans and, any, and others challenging that plan, how would you like them to see it and, and us to think of the uh, current Supreme Court term and the cases and the threats that are now being brought to it? Yeah. Well, I, I think, uh, let me put the Supreme Court aside, uh, as President Gore had to do, um, and uh, say that I can't predict what, what the Supreme Court will decide to do or intervene in that may or may not have precedent. Um, but putting that aside, look, I, I think, um, uh, you know, being a policy wonk, I could critique anybody's policy to death and, and enjoy it. But uh, I, I support what President Obama has done. I think he was courageous in getting it done. I know as well as anybody how difficult it is uh, to get done and how easy it is to um, grandstand and sort of demonize an effort like this. And uh, I applaud his, his courage and people like Nancy and Paul and others who worked on this, I think, did a great job in getting something done and uh, in, in, in a very, in an environment that's very, very difficult. Uh, is it perfect? Of course not. Uh, is it going to have to go through changes? Of course. Uh, will it evolve over time? Of course. But the fact of the matter is we have a system that's broken, and I want to be very clear about the way in which it's broken. We do deliver the best health care in the world in this country. What's broken is our system of financing health care. And what's broken is the fact that that best health care that is available, there's a whole lot of people in the country that can't access it because they don't have the money in the way the system is working, okay? So this is not a critique of, of our health professionals or our health system in that sense. It's a critique of the way we organize and finance. And, you know, where we're uncompetitive, I mean, if, if those of you who run businesses in this room, if you had a business, you know, we're spending seven, over 17% of our GDP now on health care. The next closest is 11, 12%. Uh, all the other developed countries cover everybody, we don't. Uh, their health outcomes, whether it's infant mortality, whether it's life expectancy, everything else, are at least as good as ours. And I know there are extemporaneous factors to that and so on. But basically, uh, we can't argue that our outcomes are better. They're better in certain specific ways, but not generally. Uh, if you were running a business where you were, you know, almost twice the cost of your competitors and your competitors were delivering uh, a product that was as good as yours, you'd feel like you had a problem. Now, what is the problem? Well. The first place is that we spend 30, 35% of the total system uh, cost, every dollar in health, on administrative cost, when other people are spending 10 or 12%. And it's mainly due to the way we finance and regulate our health care. And in studies we did in my home state of Rhode Island back a while ago, between uh, 1985, uh, sorry, between 1980 and 1995, if you looked at the revenue coming into the average doctor's office, uh, at the beginning of the period, about 18% of it went to administration. By the end of the period, 52% went to administration. And that period was how long? Uh, that was about a 12-year period. And the reason was because doctors had to get into the business of managing different insurance plans and essentially having different you know, software programs and then appealing this and appealing that and applying for this and applying for that. And also the, the national regulatory infrastructure increased dramatically. Uh, and then I mean, the malpractice piece was there too in the lawsuits, but, but the, the regulatory uh, requirements on hospitals and so on. And then it, it became very complex. I and mean, when we did our study in Rhode Island, 2% uh, of all the operations that were scheduled 
Um, the doctor was there, the patient was there, the paperwork didn't show up. Uh, and so the operation was canceled, literally 2% over a year and a half period. 30% uh, of the admissions to hospitals were from adverse drug reactions from different drugs prescribed by different doctors, uh, mainly among elderly people. There's a series of administrative things and financing things we have been doing in our system, which are a nightmare. Uh, and you know, my mother-in-law, when she got cancer, uh, and I uh, knew something about the healthcare system and about health financing, and I don't know how many days it took me, literally days of you know, paperwork to get coverage. Uh, she already had coverage, I'm sorry, but to get coverage honored that she had as she went through different stages of the process. And if I hadn't known everything about the system and had the clout to sort of fight it, and here, you know, average families in the United States, they have people who are ill and they're worried about the illness, and instead they're having to spend half their time worried about, am I going to get paid for this or not, and these forms and those forms, and did I fill them out right and everything. It's a goddamn nightmare. Now, what I would ask the people who are opposing what President Obama is trying to put in place to say is, you know, if you're wealthy enough, maybe you can avoid this. But this is the reality that we're facing in this country. It is a shame. It is the only country, developed country in the world, even among middle income countries, that has this kind of problem, and it's got to be fixed. And at least President Obama tried to do something about it. Now, what he's putting in place is going to get coverage to a lot more people. And if you don't have coverage in this society, that means a lot to you. It is going to uh, streamline a number of the things that I talked about, uh, and it's going to have some problems with it that are going to have to be fixed, but at least it's, it's making an attempt to do something serious. And you know, he's the seventh president that's tried to do something about our healthcare system, and the first one that succeeded in some significant way. Uh, you know, the only way Lyndon Johnson succeeded, even with Medicare and Medicaid, was essentially to give up any cost control on it. Right? And that's how he eventually got it through, and then that caused a huge inflation. But at least it got through, but we couldn't do that now. We don't have the luxury of that, and we shouldn't do it. So I, again, I'm rambling now, but I, I, I would urge everybody here, the worst thing we could do is go back to you know, legal challenges and legal battles and tearing it down. We've got a new system that's coming in. It's going to be phased in. Let's try to work with it and improve upon it, and at least we'll join the rest of the civilized world and having all our people have access to insurance, which I think is something that's uh, 50 years overdue. So we'll start with Carl Diffenbach, our visitor, um, who emphasizes um, uh, cure and prevention and cure, and then where treatment comes in that. So let's start with that. Um, being at the NIH, my primary purpose in life is first to prove the concept. We have to first demonstrate that an idea will work, and then we need to be able to move forward with implementation along the lines of what Ira just discussed. So in the past year, we have seen success with an HIV vaccine having very modest efficacy, treatment as prevention, and then pre-exposure prophylaxis for men who have sex with men and couples. Pulling that together, it really then focuses us first and foremost on how do we access the healthcare system. Testing is the primary entry point for HIV. You must first know whether a person is HIV positive or negative. If a person is HIV negative, there's a number of activities, um, research and then um, prevention strategies that are both domestic and international that need to be um, bolstered, and there's, a, there's funding gaps there. On the treatment side, with treatment now as prevention, where essentially um, a well-treated, well-adherent, HIV-positive individual has an, a, a, a essentially a 0% chance of actually transmitting their virus, essentially treatment becomes the linchpin between stable HIV-infected individuals where we can then work toward a cure, which is our a major research goal, as well as then um, be part of the prevention landscape. So where we are, receive threats on funding is we need to continue to innovate. We need to be able to continue to push um, for the innovative new strategies that are coming forward for new treatments. For example, we should be able over the next four to, four to seven years start developing injectables where essentially we can reduce therapy from one pill once a day to a series of injections maybe 12 times a year or maybe ultimately four times a year. 
That solves a lot of the adherence problems associated with pills. It would solve the supply chain issues. It would, it would fundamentally change. But injections change. are more expensive. Can I, can I just ask They're not. as a concept? It's cheaper to give an injection. Even with a staff, even with a staff and the travel In the required. long term, if you think it's, it's cheaper long term. So think about, it. you only needed four visits to the doctor a year as opposed to going and getting pills 12 times a year and remembering to well, adhere. Well, what I get is it's directly observed treatment. You and, make sure you that get they that. get it. And so you have, you have, talk about the level of adherence you have then, you have the impact on prevention. That has to be our long term vision. We need to be able to continue to innovate that. And that has to be a partnership with the private sector. So we need the private sector to continue to invest in HIV, to continue to invest in innovation. So that's the challenge to academic institutions is to continue to push for those public-private partnerships. And not to, put, um, not to put a cast on it, but is there a disproportionate burden now being asked of the private sector? The private sector in the United States. So for those of you who saw the paper this morning, Abbott is splitting into two companies. Why? To boost their stockholders' um, profits. So, it, frankly, the, the private sector is running away from the problem. They are not doing enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and what about the public sector, and what about the funding of your $1.5 billion budget? I mean, how, how are you seeing it? I'm sure that there's lots of trade-offs in distributing that. But overall, what are you seeing for the continuation of that budget? So it's all tied up in the Committee of 12. Um, if the Committee of 12 cannot reach an agreement, the NIH budget will probably be cut by 10%. Um, the, the first time ever this past year, the NIH actually had a cut. The, our partners in, in prevention, um, the CDC, um, HRSA, and the other government agencies have already received fairly significant cuts. Um, so the care side of the house continues to be attacked. Here we have these ma amazing tools of treatment. We have growing waiting lists because uh, of cuts to Ryan White, of cuts to all, all the so-called entitlement programs. It, it, we have to have this balance. Research is important. Research will give us the tools for the future. But what we're going to do is create such a burden and a backlog um, that the federal government and the state governments can never dig their way out, uh, even with health care reform. Well, I'm, I'm glad I got you to be that strong, even though you're a public official. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Hildreth, you were talking about, speaking of some of the tools that can lead to exactly this kind of um, adherence and prevention, you were talking about a microbicide that you've been testing? Yes, so uh, I'm an HIV researcher. I'm also dean of a college of biological sciences. Everyone is excessively modest here. You know, this, these are enormously distinguished people. Um, and what we're trying to do basically is to, to create a gel or a cream that when applied to the walls of the vagina or placed in the vagina will kill the virus. It's rather like a spermicide except rather being designed to kill sperm and prevent conception or pregnancy, these creams are designed to kill HIV and prevent transmission in women. An idea that's long, long been in the works, right? Yes, and there's been some success. In fact, there's a microbicide trial that recently concluded a year or so ago <laughs> using tenofovir, which is a commonly used HIV drug that was about 40% efficacious, mm -hmm. which is tremendous. Even a 40% efficacy would save millions of lives over, over a few years. So it's a very exciting area of research. And, and uh, my main concern is what Dr. Diefenbach has already referred to, the cuts. We have tremendous tools, uh, proteomics, genomics. I mean, it's a very exciting time to be in research. but um, as a dean of a faculty of talented and motivated scientists, my job is to create an environment where they can thrive and do their thing. And of course, part of that is having available funds to do their work. And all of us are very concerned that as we move into this uh, difficult time, we're going to be able to continue that exciting work. What are, what are, what's the projected efficacy of the new microbicide that you're looking at? Well, I, mean, I would hate to guess, I mean, what, what, we, what we aspire to, those of us in the field, is to have something that's completely efficacious. Yeah. If people use it, the, if women use it the way that it's meant to be used. But as I said before, even something short of that would have a huge impact on the problem moving forward. And a vaccine in combination with a preventative like that, a microbicide, would have a, um, a tremendous impact. And that's what we're aspiring to do. How many of you on the panel are, are involved in vaccine <laughs> research? You, of course. Um, but nobody's doing direct vaccine research because we were, we were talking about that before, so maybe we'll, we, maybe we'll bring it back to that. But right now you're seeing lots of effective new strategies 
like exactly what you were saying, that face the obstacles of actual implementation and finding funding to make them available. And I'm coming right to you because you've been involved in those programs for a number of years, and now you're now you're right here. Um, what are the some of what are some of the programs that have gotten you most encouraged and excited about, and what are you hoping to see move forward? Well, I think it's important to take a, a, a global view, but also since I'm a UCSD faculty member, we need to, to act locally. Um, people don't make decisions about their health in a vacuum. Um, we create the social conditions and the physical environment that make it easier or harder for people to make healthy cho choices. So we heard today um, that this wonderful space that we're in is organized in a way that makes people interact and, and, and have wonderful ideas and, and create better science. Some of the social conditions that, that drive the HIV epidemic that, that we unfortunately have bought into as, a, as an American society um, are incarceration. We have some, you know, the, the US has the, the number one uh, spot for the people that are incarcerated per capita in the whole world. We, to, today we heard that deportations are at record levels. We have the no, number one um, uh, spot for deportations in worldwide, we 400,000 people, um, and 500 people get dumped in Tijuana every single day where I do my work. The war on drugs, um, and also limiting women's reproductive choices, and I was very happy to hear that, that Dr. Hildreth is working on a microbicide. But some of the, um, what, what's happening in our political environment and then the funding environment that we're in is that, that policies, health policies and immigration policies and other types of, of policies are at odds. They're colliding. We are, are totally unraveling some of the advances that we have made in not just in HIV prevention and treatment but in, in um, health overall. And so I think as global citizens we need to take a broader approach and we, we have to um, create some of the solutions rather than being, being part of the problem. And so we have, for example, a national AIDS prevention strategy that President Obama is the first president to have ever had that. So we, we actually know some of the answers. So I would say that yes, we need to invest in the future, but some of the answers are right in front of us. We know that needle exchange works, and yet now we have another bill that's being put forward to unfund it yet again. I, I, it's very frustrating that we're going around in circles. We are also taking away women's reproductive choices. And so we need to stop this. Um, I, I, as scientists, I think that we have to decide as individuals when the science stops and when the advocacy begins. But when we know the answers, it is our moral obligation to do the right thing. And, talk, and, and give us some of the examples of some of the answers that are absolutely effective besides needle exchange that you see being threatened that you've been involved with implementing? Well, I think Dr. Diefenbach um, spoke very eloquently a few minutes ago saying that we, for the first time, now that we know that, that HIV prevention and treatment and treatment as prevention are working and yet now uh, and we now are on the verge of having a malaria vaccine for the first time but if we don't invest in the NIH and the CDC and HRSA and ADAP programs and Title 10 we are going to undercut all of these advances and it's going to hurt the future generation. I think the, uh, public education is also um, at, at a real risk of, of losing the next generation of, of researchers out there that can come up with some of these inventions. But talking about local, bring it back to the UCSD School of Medicine. And are you seeing that some of your grants that used to get funded are being discontinued? Absolutely. And, and I, I'm most, I am most worried about our trainees, uh, you know, people who are just coming out, getting their PhD, entering their postdoc, these are the folks that are, are getting cut. And that is going to have a huge, huge um, a tragedy for, the, for n generations to come. Um, sorry to be rubbing this wound, but can you give us an example of an actual program or something that you were excited about, a research initiative, a grant that you've learned in the past year, say, isn't going to be continued or cut that, at, at, and the potential that it had? Well, there's several researchers, even in my own division, who um, have, have grants. Um, one is, for example, a young Mexican-American who wrote what's called a KO1. It's a, a career training award. 
He scored uh, in the top 10%. Uh, he's been told maybe he'll get it, maybe he won't. I mean, this is somebody who um, is a, a future leader. And you know, a couple of years ago, that would have been a slam dunk. And now uh, I've told him, well, you know, you're going to have to go back to, cl to clinical medicine for a while. And hopefully, uh, maybe if the, we don't have a continuing resolution where the government's fighting over how much money the NIH is going to get. Uh, maybe you'll get funded and maybe you'll have five years of support, but after that, who knows, that's just one, one example. Is it a place for the private sector to be entrepreneurial and to try to step in and create its own grant review pro process? Can you, you see? You want my opinion on that? I don't think so. I think there's a partnership that everybody needs to do their part and there's a role for private industry in innovation and development of of, of novel therapies um, and activities. So government should do what industry can't or won't, and that's mm -hmm. the partnership we need. I think that we need, you know, right now at the NIH, 80% um, um, of the grants that we receive don't get funded. Um, in a good time when we were um, in, the, in the Clinton era, the number was closer to 70% um, of the grants, or 65% or of the grants didn't get funded. That's still a very high bar because you really want to support the highest quality of research. But when you get down to 18, 20, 15 percent of the grants are all that get funded and 85 percent are not being funded, you just get so conservative that you can't innovate. Mm -hmm. Conservative and not innovating. That's an important trend and theme that was coming out in all of our conversations and it's important for you to come away with. Can we thank you for that opinion? Can we go to... Um, Mr. Buckingham and talk something about the Peace Corps since we've been talking about Africa. And isn't the Peace Corps itself, it's a very naive question, isn't the Peace Corps itself threatened? Uh, yes. Um, to put things in perspective, I, I expect some of you are wondering uh, why in the world there's a representative of the Peace Corps here. Uh, in some ways I feel like I'm uh, more a representative of Forrest Gump. Uh, I am living with HIV, was diagnosed uh, 27 years ago, uh, was part of the first community response in Dallas, Texas, came to Washington to work on the Ryan White Care Act, had the privilege of serving on the Health Care Reform Task Force, uh, and then began working overseas, including directing the PEPFAR program, which we haven't mentioned at all, uh, for six years in Kenya. Um, and Peace Corps has been part of PEPFAR from the beginning. Um, and I think that w the value that we represent in any global initiative, but particularly in one like HIV, as we try to translate proven research um, interventions mm -hmm. into effective programmatic practice, is the last mile or the last kilometer and reaching the most at risk, the most overlooked, and the most vulnerable populations, and doing it in an incredibly cost-effective way. Um, I know that Dr. Magaziner and others are, are very concerned about efficiency. We're talking about cuts in budgets, but we also need to look as critically and creatively as we can about the huge resources that we do have available to us. And in Peace Corps, um, the full cost of recruiting, screening, training, orienting, fielding, and repatriating someone for 27 months of service overseas is about $50,000, and there's no better bargain. Uh, but to put budgets in perspective, uh, I spend a lot of time representing Peace Corps in the world of PEPFAR at headquarters, and in last year's budget compromise, PEPFAR, with an overall budget that is approaching $5 billion, uh, was cut by about $14.2 million. Peace Corps has a budget for everything it does in 70 countries around the world of $400 million, and our budget was cut by $25 million, a cut more than twice the size of the PEPFAR budget cut uh, on a much, much smaller base. Uh, so um, it, it, it's all relative. That's the future generation. <laughs> I mean, no, really, it's, it's just lack of investment. Uh, we've seen sound bites. That's a, that's a visual bite right there. Um, um, Dr. Reed, uh, did any of you go to the Sanford Burnham? Yeah, so you, you've been on the tour. You've seen some of the research they're doing, which I didn't get to do. So could you tell us about it and then give us an idea of the public-private sector bra breakdown and what you see growing and shrinking? Okay. Well, at, at the uh, Institute, one of our areas of investigation is in infectious and inflammatory diseases, and a component of that is, is HIV research. I, I personally am involved in HIV research. 
the, uh, the main thrust I think that we're really quite excited about these days is trying to understand in the case of HIV, what are the cellular genes, what are the genes in the host cell that are required for the virus to be successful? So, you know, viruses are actually not living things. Uh, they can only replicate and become alive, if you will, uh, in a cell. And they usurp the cellular machinery in order to do that. So some of our scientists like Sumit Chanda, who's uh, together with John Salk, uh, or, or John Young here at the Salk, are leading a national effort to use genome-wide approaches, so-called systems biology, to define all the genes in our cells that the HIV, vi vi HIV virus requires to be successful. And from that, we begin to find uh, perhaps new targets for drug discovery, where the idea is to, is to neutralize the self genes that the virus requires rather than the virus. And the advantage of that is that our genes don't mutate, whereas the virus is constantly mutating and sort of slipping away from us, which is why it's so difficult to, uh, to come up with vaccines and, and, and therapies that work on a long-term basis. So this is an interesting new strategy, and uh, there's beginning to develop more uh, evidence as a proof of concept that this could be a new way to fight viruses in general, and HIV in particular. So that's one of the main thrusts. Who was talking about robbing the cells of cholesterol? James was. Can you just, can you give an idea of that concept? So as was stated, viruses are not living things. They must enter a cell to replicate, and they use the reproductive machinery in the cells for making proteins and lipids and those things. What we've been interested in is how a virus with such a modest genome is only 10,000 base pairs can have such a complex biology and it seems to achieve that complexity by usurping the pathways and proteins that the cells make. And in doing that work we discovered that cholesterol was an essential uh, component or requirement for the virus to be viable. If you remove the cholesterol from the virus or the cells HIV cannot replicate. And we've been using that as a, a basis for our microbicide strategy and also for some new uh, therapeutic approaches. And yet it only um, prevents the genome of the AIDS virus from being fully oper operational and functional? No, it actually turns out that many viruses that are enveloped, that is, that are contained within the lipid shell, have this same requirement. They must have cholesterol. Well, and does that make us wonderfully immune to harmful viruses or also uh, somehow uh, vulnerable to many other threats through this? Well, it's, it's quite normal for nature to take something that works and use it over and over again, and that's why many viruses probably use, have the same operating principle. And what's the way of robbing these genomes from of getting rid of that cholesterol? Well, there's a couple of ways. You can prevent the synthesis of cholesterol by using statins, the same drugs that are used to treat hypercholesterolemia. Our friends, the statins. <laughs> or there's a, turns out to be a sugar called beta-cyclodextrin that will quickly and very efficiently remove cholesterol from biological membranes. And who's pursuing this research right now? We are. Somebody right in your, in, in your school that can use some funding by any chance? Yes, always. <laughs> Um, so now we well thank you for this is these are all urgent needs and uh, and now I'm going to invite questions and invite Ira Magaziner to come back and I think give him my chair. The question is obviously we're dealing with an international problem. Viruses, bacteria, the parasites don't have any borders. What parasites without borders. <laughs> Is there integration on the international level as far as funding for healthcare initiatives for research and the like? Is, is it as dysfunctional as our own uh, healthcare system seems to be as far as on an international scale? Well, I, you're posing this question. Did you all hear the question? Is, is the system as dysfunctional on an international scale as we have been hearing it is on a, on a national scale? Perhaps Buck Buck in with <laughs> international uh, and then our. Um, yeah, I, I, I would say that the WHO is um, chronically underfunded. Uh, is um, uh, We heard reference to PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, which is part of the WHO. Uh, it's also an incredibly variable institution depending on the parts of the world where you're engaged. Uh, and they haven't, I don't believe in my experience, seen a significant part of their responsibility being the kind of harmonization that the Clinton folks have done. They've much been much more focused on developing and promulgating normative guidance rather than trying to bring us all together for maximum impact. But in theory, that is part of their mandate, right? I honestly don't know how they were constructed originally. 
Okay, I guess we have an optimist. Did you want to reply to that? I, I do think that um, uh, that increasingly groups like the Gates Foundation and some of the other large donors and other large implementing organizations like ourselves are, uh, by our nature, set up to be global. In, in, and uh, I think um, uh, uh, that has helped with, with, with harmonization. I think there's always a trade-off. Um, if you're a UN organization or a WHO, you have to spend a lot of your time in meetings trying to give everybody a say on something and then try to reach some longer-term consensus on something. And on certain issues and problems, that's important. It's essential to, to build that kind of long-term consensus. When you're facing a crisis like AIDS or something like that, uh, you really don't have the time to, to, to do that. And so there's room for organizations like ours that can move much faster and get stuff done quickly, even if not always in a very pretty way. Uh, but actually, to, and so I think there's really two architectures that have developed in the world that uh, cooperate with each other, um, but that move at different paces and kind of work on different problems. I, I remember hearing a woman who started her own foundation say, when people uh, are always, I, I, she was very experienced in the foundational world, and she said, my grant making turnaround is overnight. So you know, it depends. On, everyone has different turnarounds depending on their on their source of funding and their structure. We have a question there. Uh, yeah, one. Of, I'm Jeff Broido. One of, one of the themes that keeps coming up through this conference seems to me to be how totally ineffective the U.S. government has been. If there's been one really bright spot, it's been how foundations have been able to move with the kind of speed that the problems require. Uh, and I wonder if society-wise, we are not all sunk into the, the belief that the U.S. government is the only answer. And if they can't do it, if they won't do it, then we're stuck. Uh, it seems to me that somehow the foundation, the, 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 with its ability to move quickly, is a, a crucial part that has to play a much larger role. And this is true not only in this health area, but if we go back yesterday to the, to the energy area, to things that we heard in the lab tours. All of the stumbling blocks were because you had to swim through uh, mounds of federal paperwork, waste incredible amounts of the fractions of the, of the money on, on dealing with the requirements. Anyhow, I think Well, since we have one of those obfuscating bureaucrats right next to me who is halting the entire course of the future of medical research, I'd like to have a Carl Diefenbach reply to that. So I think let's start with the success of PEPFAR as a, as a shining example. Um, I think that the partnerships between Gates and PEPFAR and CHAI have been fantastic. And so when, when, they're, when the stars align, um, things work really well. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that federal funding, by its very definition, should come with some strings attached because it's your taxpayer's dollar. And we are held accountable for how we spend it. A foundation ultimately is accountable to its donors. Um, and so if we had, didn't have some level of oversight, um, we would not be good stewards of the taxpayer's money. The other point I would make about federal funding is foundations can solve the problems that have an interest to the donors. Exactly. The advantage of federal funding is it, is re it really allows us to address the fundamental questions and problems facing a range of areas that no, do that no foundation really would care to pick up. So I think, I think there has to be partnership. But I think just to say that, you know, yes, it, the grant process is onerous. And the, part of the reason it's onerous is because there's not enough funding in the system. Uh, people have to write four and five grants to get one. That's the nature of the, of the business. But you can't blame the, the granting process. The problem is starts in the Congress. That's exactly and, right. And Dr. Hill. <laughs> it's true. Oh, that's my opinion. <laughs> I just want to add that one of the most important things that the government can do is fund basic science. That's what I was about because, to bring up. Because without funding for basic science, many of the interventions and new treatments would not have been possible. And so I would just urge all of us and everyone to make sure that we don't lose that. Um, there's a wonderful story of uh, a new way of treating malaria or preventing malaria by having a certain bacteria grow in the mosquitoes that prevent the malaria parasites from growing. 
that was the result of some long, long years of basic science and understanding the symbiosis between these organisms. And that's one example of how basic science can have a huge impact. So one of the things the government can do that we need to keep them doing is funding basic science with no obvious translational importance. That always comes later. Just and Dr. Ray. Yeah, I, I uh, wanted to support that notion, but I also wanted to couch it more in, I guess, economic terms of why funding basic research is so important to the global competitiveness of the United States. If you take National Institutes of Health, for example, which funds probably about 80% uh, of the basic uh, research in the life sciences area, now we, it's been said that biotechnology will be to the 21st century what information technology was the last century. So clearly as a nation, we want to be on the cutting edge of that. We want to be leading that. And it's interesting to look at balances of trade. There are only a couple areas where the United States still enjoys a favorable balance of trade. And number one on the list is intellectual property. That's our inventions. That's what the rest of the world pays us to access what we invent. And if you look at programs like NIH, these really act as catalysts for this. 98% of all grants awarded by NIH result in an invention disclosure, 54% in, in a grant application, in a patent application, 26% uh, in an issued patent. It's a great source of innovation. That intellectual property drives capital to our country. It creates jobs, it creates, it creates new companies. And it really is a fountain then from which we can spur economic development. If you do the math on the inventions that flow out of NIH funded research, on a very conservative basis, the program more than pays, more than double pays for itself in the tax revenues generated as a result of the economic activity generated. So it's one of the, maybe it's one of the few, but it is a government program that actually is, is, um, is economically uh, stimulatory and that actually nets a return to the federal government in terms of the uh, tax base it creates through the activities. So I just look at this as, as some of the issues we have to deal with as we're living this, in this time of tough choices. I mean, look, you know, we, we've spent a lot as a, as a, as a society, as a government. Uh, in the 2000, we had almost no national debt. Today, it's 14 trillion and grow, growing at a rate of, of 1 trillion a year. It's about 70% of GDP now. So we have to make tough choices. And I think these choices have to be based uh, in, in thinking smartly about how we're going to be competitive as a nation going forward. So let's keep funding it and our magazine. And I just, uh, I, I want to both agree and sort of nuance what you're saying. First of all, I think National Institute of Health and what it's accomplished is magnificent. And it is a crucially important piece of the fabric here for the reasons that have been said. Um, and both in terms of advancing the ability for us to have the tools to, uh, to care for people and also uh, advancing basic science research and helping the competitiveness of our industry. And uh, so, and when you're doing basic research of the sort they do, private industry typically won't fund something at that earlier stage. And so they're absolutely essential in doing it and they do it well in my opinion. And they've helped build a, an infrastructure at institutes like this, at universities and so on, that carries on that world leading work. So. I, I think it's a tragedy and a huge mistake that this country is not funding uh, to an even greater extent the work that NIH and other sister institutions like it do. Now, where I have a problem with the way the U.S. government works is that the, the things that were set up after World War II to create organizations like NIH and DARPA and other government research organizations uh, created a, a full cost recovery model with universities and so on and institutes which were absolutely necessary to allow them to build the sort of labs and other things they needed to do their work right. The problem was that when USAID was formed and even some of the other groups that do work in the field in Africa or Asia, they took the same model of taking 25-30% overhead off the top and high administrative costs and so on when it wasn't necessary and, in fact, adds a lot of extra cost and time to things. So what we see often with uh, U.S. aid programs is that only about 25, 35 cents on the dollar is actually going to the program. And there's also a lot of inefficient practices in the way the contracting is done and the oversight is done. And so in, in delivery of programs abroad, 
and we're now doing something um, with some universities uh, to try to break the mold on this. Um, the biggest issue with respect to lack of funds, the enemy's us, and it's the way we've organized our aid industry, if you will, our aid system, and the group of consulting firms and so on that carry out these contracts. And I think we have a responsibility to clean that up and to lower the overheads there and get much better value for the dollar. And there I think um, uh, we're representing the taxpayer because that's not a question of cutting back on the services. But we too often see governments in Africa and Asia that are having to make Sophie's choices about, you know, do I let people with malaria die or let people with AIDS die because I don't have enough money. And yet two-thirds of the money they're getting from the United States government is being spent on administrative costs to fund Americans or to fund business class airfares or things like that, which have no place in the kind of work that we do in development. So I think uh, I would distinguish those two things. I'm partly agreeing with your comment, but I don't want your comment to spill over to what the research work that these guys do because, I mean, everything we're able to implement depends upon them. You know, we're waiting for a microbicide that can work because it will have a huge impact on the world. And so I wish you good luck with what you're doing. And you doing. were saying it was going to be 10 cents an application, right? That's what we're shooting that for. That would be huge. That, that, be that huge. would be enormous. Uh, we've, we have time for two more questions. And, and actually, the first one is going to be the woman who's been waiting at the back. She's next. She's next. OK, fine. OK. Uh, Claire runs this show. I just want to mention another illness, which is polio, how that is uh, spreading all over the world right now. And there is two organizations. One is the Gates Foundation has just contributed $300 million and a rotary International Foundation has donated $170 million and have people all over the world working to eradicate polio. Um, and here we're not using any government money, it's just uh, people donating money. And we have to get other organizations like Rotary to donate money to eradicate HIV. Here, here. I'm glad you mentioned Rotary and that. Did you want to? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think, you know, we're working now with Gates on you know, getting IPV and getting lower priced IPV that can uh, assist in that battle. There will ultimately be government money necessary uh, for the rollout and, and uh, through Gavi, and, and that will happen. But I agree to you. I think one of the things our generation will do, and I know Bill Gates is very committed to this, uh, is to eradicate polio. And I think through the efforts of Rotary Gates and others, um, uh, that's possible in our generation, and we ought to make it a, uh, a, a something we, d we, we accomplish. Hi, um, my name is Elizabeth Vandenberg. I'm an alum of UCSD, so thank you so much for making this conference so great. My question is, I was lucky enough to go to the Scripps um, lab yesterday, and it was the marine medicine uh, component. And it seems to me we talk a lot about this pure uh, application of science, which I totally agree with. I love the visual. And how do we, how do we get the pure lab work that we're doing in universities across the United States more directly related to the applications that could then possibly feed money back into them. So the idea is with the marine medicine, how do we get those closer to pharma? Because that's where the money could maybe recycle back. And is there a possibility of that besides venture capitalists? Yeah, do you two want to talk about this? I, I, I could offer a couple comments. Um, one step that's being attempted at the level of the NIH is to create a new center at NIH that's devoted to what they call translational sciences. In this business of taking basic discoveries and translating them towards a practical application. Unfortunately, it's, it's still uh, sort of mired in political debate uh, within Congress. The, uh, the Senate has come out in favor, the uh, House uh, opposed, and we're not sure if the new center will get created, but it's something that we think would be an important step in that direction to actually create as a component of NIH, and again, NIH is being mentioned so many times because it funds so much of the medical research, that would be really be focused on how can we do a better job of translating all this wonderful science into something practical. The, the other part comes all the way down at the other end of the feeding chain, and that is the onerous process of actually getting a product approved by the FDA. That is a process that takes 13 years of $1.2 billion on average. And we've got nobody from FDA to defend her or himself. So you can attack them at will. Well, it's, you know, I, I think um, the FDA, um, I think it suffers from like a lot of um, federal government, 
of government agencies in terms of it's, it's, it's bureaucratic and slow moving, et cetera. There's a lot of good intent, but it needs to be reorganized, restructured, and fundamental reform needs to happen. It can be done. I mean, we saw what happened in Europe. The European countries got together and decided they wanted to have the best regulatory system in the world, and they've done a lot of things, I think, to make the EU much more attractive and much more efficient. On average, for example, um, uh, uh, medical devices, for example, will get approved in Europe four years before we'll ever see them here. As a result of that, in the medical device industry, if all the development is done in Europe for the most part, all those dollars go overseas. In the pharma uh, industry, even 60 billion a year leaves this country and goes to Europe to develop drugs because they have a regulatory system that works more in partnership with the companies they're trying to develop. So the bottom line being though, if, if we're gonna continue to make it so difficult to get things approved, you're not gonna have the venture capitalists and the others who are gonna to wanna to pull these inventions out of the lab and see them uh, come into the marketplace. So we, we really need to do that. And it, it's interesting to note that the FDA regulates the goods and services that account for about 20 to 25% of the entire US economy. So this is not a trivial issue. This is something we need as a society to take a look at and figure out how do we fix this. Uh, I would personally start by taking the drug part, the D, out and separating uh, food and cosmetics and those things and making a focused agency that can be more streamlined, more elite, and, and more modern. Well, I, I'm, entirely, I'm entirely for that because I'm in favor of one unified food agency. So I think that, uh, so we can all have our way. We have Stephanie and then Dr. Uh, um, because your question was about marine sciences, I, I have a very nice local example from UCSD. And we have a professor, uh, Dr. Bill Gerwick and, and Lena Ger Gerwick from, the, they have appointments at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography as well as UCSD's pharmaceutical sciences. And they do some fantastic work in Panama where they're mining natural products. Uh, Panama has incredible biodiversity. They have funding from the Fogarty International Center as well as other institutes at the NIH and the Smithsonian Institute. And what this allows them to do is to train both U.S. investigators and Panamanian investigators. They're training side by side. They're developing these natural marine products products and then they're working with the pharmaceutical industry in their applications. So I think it shows an incredible investment that's been funded since 1988. Thank you. And Dr. Hilder? Well, I think one of the key things to getting the basic discoveries turned into something that's practical or, or applicable in medicine or whatever is bringing the basic scientists and the translational and clinical scientists together under one roof and tearing down the silos so that they can talk with each other and share ideas and I think that's the key, and that's what we're aspiring to at UC Davis, and I know that's happening at many other places as well. That's a perfect note to end on because we've heard about the sulk has no walls. The room we are in is completely open to exactly that kind of collaboration. I'm excited for all of you get to tour the Institute, but I'm most excited that we had a great panel of people and a great keynote speaker who kindly joined us again and a terrific audience. Thank you for a really provocative, stimulating discussion.